Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. Today, we'll continue our playlist on pulmonology, and we'll talk about diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide, or DLCO. It's DLCO, or TLCO. Both of them are correct. We give the patient carbon monoxide, the patient inhales carbon monoxide, holds his breath for 10 seconds, then exhales carbon monoxide, then we measure carbon monoxide. Why all of this? This is the story of today's video and let's get started. First of all, I want you to know that DLCO is the same thing as TLCO. DLCO stands for diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide. TLCO stands for transfer factor for carbon monoxide. So here are the steps of the test. First, you give the patient a measured amount of CO through a mask and then ask him to take a single maximal deep breath to the fullest until you reach the TLC. So <gasps> like this. Patient is asked to hold breath for 10 seconds, then exhale maximally until that residual volume. Because as you know, so here is the TLC. And here is the tidal volume. Up there is what? Inspiratory reserve volume and down there we have two things up we have expiratory reserve volume and we have the residual volume you want your patient to empty his lung of all of this until we reach the residual volume because you cannot get the residual volume out then you measure the amount of carbon monoxide in the exhaled air after neglecting the dead space. You subtract the dead space because as you know, there is no gas exchange in the dead space. A normal person should deliver all of the CO from the respiratory tract to the bloodstream. It has to jump on the hemoglobin. And as you know, hemoglobin has a huge affinity for carbon monoxide, even better than oxygen. If the patient's lungs are normal, all of the carbon monoxide will jump from the alveoli to the red blood cells. Okay, this is the sophisticated idea, but for dummies, for, for you and me, think about giving CO via mask, so we'll give CO here, we measure the amount of CO here, this is one, and then we measure the amount of CO on the red blood cells, on the hemoglobin, and this is number two. Okay, if you understand this, you'll understand what's going to happen, what are the causes of increased DLCO, decreased DLCO, and normal DLCO. You measure it here and you measure it here. It's not actually what happened in reality, but if you think about it, you'll get every question right. As you know, carbon monoxide has high affinity for hemoglobin or hemoglobin has high affinity for CO. So it jumps on the red blood cells hemoglobin. The amount of CO absorbed is determined by two factors. This is important. Number one, the amount of blood going to the alveolar capillary bed. So this is the story of perfusion the surface area available for diffusion. So here is the alveolus. So here's the alveolus, here's the pulmonary artery, the surface area available for diffusion. Those are the two factors. So causes of decreased DLCO. Number one, decrease the amount of blood going to the alveolus or decrease the surface area available for gas exchange or diffusion. Fine. Those are the only two things. What are the causes of increased DLCO? Number one, increase perfusion, increase the blood going to the alveolar. Please don't say increase the surface area of the alveolar because it doesn't exist. I have n I'm not aware of any disease that can increase the surface area of your alveoli. If you know, please let me know down below in the comments, but it doesn't happen. What do you want? A third lung? Shut up. So in brief, if your alveolar capillary interface is normal, the DLCO is going to be normal. If you have problem with diffusion or perfusion, your DLCO is going to be low. If you have super perfusion, your DLCO is going to be high. That's it. What are the causes of normal DLCO, low DLCO, or high DLCO? Now, where else in the world will you find medical information organized in this manner? Kaplan Medical? Oh, give me a break. 
I'm joking, of course. So let's start with normal DLCL. Number one, normal individuals. No kidding. Of course, normal individuals will have normal DLCL. What else? Extrinsic restrictive lung disease such as chest wall problems. Because if you have chest wall problems, let's say kyphoscoliosis, and you are breathing in less CO. Okay, I'm breathing in less CO. So less CO is going to my alveolus. But every drop of CO that entered my alveolus, okay, through the mask, will end up in the blood. So the DLCO is going to be normal because I succeeded in transferring 100% of the CO from the alveolus to the CO. But you have a chest wall problems. It doesn't matter because it's not in the lung. So the same air that you br breathed in with carbon monoxide, all of it ended up on the hemoglobin. So again, it's normal. Or asthma, again, no alveolar disease. It's a bronchial hyperreactivity disease. Okay, fine. So these are the causes of normal DLCO. Normal individuals, extrinsic restrictive lung disease, COPD if it's due to chronic bronchitis, as well as asthma. How about emphysema? No, no, no. Emphysema is here because it's an alveolar disease. Wait a sec. Okay, what causes low DLCO? Either decreased perfusion, decrease the blood, or decreased diffusion, decrease the surface area of the alveolar. What causes decreased perfusion, which means decrease the blood going to the alveoli? First, CHF if it's caused by asystolic dysfunction. The heart cannot pump blood. The right ventricle cannot pump blood. The right ventricle cannot pump blood into the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery delivered less blood to the alveolar interface. If you deliver less blood, you have delivered less red blood cells. You have delivered less hemoglobin. You will catch less carbon monoxide. So if the carbon monoxide in the alveolus was 100%, what ended up in your blood was 80% because you delivered less blood. Sorry, fact of life. So CHF is going to lead to decreased DLCO. Next, is pulmonary arterial hypertension, which ca can cause by a lot of stuff. It could be idiopathic, or it could be lots of things. But think about this pulmonary artery as being narrowed. If it's a narrow artery, it has less blood. If it has less blood, it has less red blood cells. If it has less red blood cells, it has less hemoglobin. If it has less hemoglobin, it's going to catch less of the CO. If 100% ended up in the alveoli, only 80% or 70% is going to end up in the artery which will lead to DLCO. Also in primary or pulmonary arterial hypertension, later you have thickening of this arterial wall, which is horrible. Again, DLCO is gonna go down. Or it could be damaged to the pulmonary artery by very, very important systemic sclerosis, formerly known as scleroderma. Extremely important for your exam. Scleroderma, pulmonary artery hypertension. Scleroderma, pulmonary artery damage. Scleroderma, pulmonary artery damage. Also lupus, it affects everywhere in your body, it's horrible, or mixed connective tissue disease. Please don't say rheumatoid, it's possible, but it's rare. Next, how about a pulmonary thromboembolism, DVT leading to pulmonary embolus. Let's say that you have an embolus here, bad embolus. Do you think blood is going to go to the capillary alveolar interface? No. So even if the alveolar had 100% of CO, this artery is going to have, let's say, I don't know, 30%. Of CO. Okay, so DLCO is down. Next, we have anemia. In anemia, you have less hemoglobin. You have less capacity to pick up CO. Therefore, the DLCO is going to be low. It's called common sense. And this was the first half. Decreased DLCO due to decreased perfusion. The second half due to decreased diffusion or the surface area of the alveolus available for the exchange. Pay attention. Intrinsic, not extrinsic, intrinsic, baby, intrinsic restrictive lung disease. The problem is in the freaking lung itself, such as bleomycin, amuterone, methotrexate, or nitrofurantoin. All of this will lead to pulmonary fibrosis, which is a problem intrinsically in the lung. It's not an extrinsic problem. Therefore, the alveolar interface is done. It's damaged. So less CO is going to end up in the alveoli. Therefore, less CO is going to end up in the pulmonary artery. Fine. COPD to the emphysema. Again, emphysema has elastase, which has destroyed elastin, which are the elastic fibers in the 
alveoli and the lung. The alveolar unit is now history. Less CO will end up in the alveoli. Less CO will end up in the artery and it's low DLCO. And those are the causes of low DLCO. We are done. Let's talk about the cause of high DLCO. I told you before, it has to be due to increased perfusion. There is no such thing in medicine as increased surface area of diffusion. Example of increased perfusion. Cardiac shunt such as left to right shunt. Here is your beautiful heart. Okay, from the left, which has oxygen, to the right, which doesn't have oxygen. Now, more blood is going to go to the lung to be exchanged. Okay, this is the pulmonary artery. Therefore, even if 100% or 100% went to the alveoli, okay, 110% will end up in the artery. Why? Because I have more blood coming there. I increased my perfusion. It's not going to be 100%, 110 because like in real life, it's going to be like this is 90% and we expect the DLCO to be 90%, for instance, and it's like 100%. It's more than predicted. So this is increased DLCO. CHF due to diastolic dysfunction. Now the left atrium cannot receive blood from the lung. Blood is going to pool in the lung, increasing lung perfusion, increasing the DLCO. Exercise leads to more perfusion. So if you have a professional athlete, the DLCO is going to be high. Why? Increase perfusion. And if he is exercising right now, he's increasing the perfusion to his lungs. Alveolar hemorrhage. Oh, really? Such as good pasture syndrome or anti-glomerular basement membrane antibody, which affects your alveoli and affects your glomeruli, leading to hemoptysis and hematuria respectively. Also granulomatosis with polyangiitis, which has the C anchor, which affects your rhinosinuses, leads to nasal septal perforation, affects your lung and affects your kidney. If your alveoli are bleeding, they will bleed into the artery. They are, let's say the alveoli are bleeding like this, okay? The blood's coming from the vessels around them. And these vessels, guess what? They come from the pulmonary artery. Now we have more blood in the space. So they have more RBCs. This more blood has more hemoglobin. They will pick up more carbon monoxide leading to increased DLCO. Pulmonary infarction, really? Yes because you increase blood flow to the normal lung. Let's say that this is your beautiful lung, okay? It was beautiful, but now you have an infarction, which looks like a wedge, like a triangle. Blood flow to the infarcted area is gonna decrease, but blood flow to your normal lung is gonna be increased, baby. So you increased DLCO, because there is more blood, there is more red blood cells, there is more hemoglobin to pick up the carbon monoxide. Increasing DLCO. What else? Severe. Late stage asthma. Ooh, those are hemoglobin related problems. Why? Is it due to the asthma? No, I've just told you that asthma has normal DLCO. It's the severe late stage because of the neovascularization, new blood vessel formation or revascularization. You have more blood vessels. You have more blood. You have more red blood cells. You have more hemoglobin. More hemoglobin is going to pick up more CO, increasing the DLCO. Erythrocytosis for the same freaking reason. Blood transfusion for the same freaking reason. So don't say just asthma, it's the severe late stages of asthma. Remember diabetes, in the late stages you have what? New blood vessel formation in your retina, leading to diabetic retinopathy, which is horrible. So it's the same freaking concept. And it's usually due to the horrible substance called VEGF. Okay, vascular endothelial growth factor. Now some clinical pearls for the pro. Let's say that a patient had perforated eardrum and you are putting this mask on his nose. All right, see what's going to happen. Let's say you are delivering 90% of carbon monoxide through the mask and you expect the DLCO to be 90%. You expect 90% to come back. But this patient is weird. Why is this patient weird? Because he has perforated eardrum. All right, okay, all right. Some of the CO will go from the machine, okay, and go to the perforated eardrum through his system, into his blood, picked up by the hemoglobin. And since you expect the DLCO to come back 90% because you only gave 90% in the mass, some of it came from the machine to his ear. So it's now gonna be in the blood like 200%. What, is that even possible? Yes, only when you have a perforated eardrum. What do you mean by 20, 200%? I mean 200% of predicted, okay? It's double the predicted value. Okay, 
Bleomycin, it's a chemotherapy. Okay, what is the mechanism of action? It forms Fe2, which is ferrous, bound to DNA, superoxide and hydroxyl free radicals. And you know, free radicals are freaking fatal. Okay, F those free radicals, man. They damage the cells. Oh, but they are damaged the cancer cells. Okay, they are glorious. Indications, Hodgkin's disease. Adverse effects, pulmonary fibrosis. Intrinsic or extrinsic? Intrinsic. The problem is in the lung itself, baby. So, if it's intrinsic, do you think the DLCO is going to be normal or low? And the answer is going to be low. The earliest sign of pulmonary deterioration in a patient on bleomycin is a decline in DLCO, or could be a cough. If your patient is on bleomycin or amiodarone, you should frequently check the DLCO, which is part of the pulmonary function test, because the spirometer the spirometer in many cases will be normal, but the only thing that's gonna be abnormal is the DLCO. So the DLCO is very good, man. Even if the spirometer is living under a rock, the DLCO will pick up the crap and show you there is a problem in this patient's lung so that you may, well, I don't know, adjust the dose or stop the drug, like talk to your oncologists. If DLCO is less than 60% of predicted, this means poor prognosis for lung resection because we do this test if we want to resect the lung, let's say pneumonectomy. Patient has extensive tuberculosis or lung cancer and would like to do a pneumonectomy. Okay, you should let us operate? No, we should test. Will this patient survive? You do a DLCO. If it's less than 60%, poor prognosis. If it's less than 40%, it's a contraindication to thoracic surgery. I'm not operating in the spirit. But why not? He has cancer. He's gonna die. He's gonna die even after the operation. It's not gonna matter. It's a very, very, very unfortunate situation. And just let me tell you this. If your DLCO is less than 40% and you have lung cancer, the cancer has probably spread to your brain and to your adrenal and to everywhere. Even if I remove your both lungs, which is impossible, you're not gonna survive. It's a very sad thing. Pulmonary arterial hypertension sometimes show isolated reduction of DLCO. While the spirometer is living the dream and living under a rock and shows normal results, only the DLCO will show the actual problem. Or in pulmonary arterial hypertension, you might find reduction in DLCO that's out of proportion to reduction in the pulmonary volumes. So the spirometer showed, okay, this patient was like, yeah, a little decrease, slightly decrease, but the DLCO is showing like this. What? This is pulmonary artery hypertension. You have your clue. In cases of intrinsic restrictive lung disease, DLCO may decrease even before the lung volumes start to decrease. The spirometer is living the dream and it's showing normal results, but DLCO is picking up the real problem. DLCO is excellent. DLCO is the first parameter to decrease in interstitial lung disease. Low DLCO is a risk factor for interstitial lung disease. Translation, if you have a low DLCO now and like quote unquote, your lung is normal, okay? You're more likely in the future to get an interstitial lung disease. Did you say cause? No, no, no. I said a risk factor because correlation is not the same as causation. If I see a reduction in DLCO that's out of proportion to the reduction in pulmonary volumes, think first pulmonary arterial hypertension, as you know, pulmonary embolus or anemia. And on your exam, the question will describe a patient with chronic dyspnea, lung symptoms, normal spirometry, normal lung volumes, and low DLCO. Choose one of these three horrible diseases. As you know, COPD is an umbrella term that includes chronic bronchitis and emphysema. In chronic bronchitis, there is no alveolar disease, there is normal DLCO. Emphysema, there is alveolar disease, and therefore there is decreased DLCO. Again, this is so technical and trivial because most patients have both, so it's not gonna matter that much. And remember, in the past, chronic bronchitis was the blue bloater, and the emphysema was the pink puffer, and we'll talk about this later. But in reality, patients have both most of the time. DLCO should be adjusted for hemoglobin. No kidding, because anemia did what to the DLCO? Decreased the DLCO. How about polycythemia? It increased the DLCO. So you should adjust the DLCO for hemoglobin if you want to really measure the freaking lung. We tell the patients before coming to measure your DLCO, do not smoke a cigarette at least for 24 hours. But some patients cheat, you know, patients lie, as Dr. House said. 
This will lead to increased carboxyhemoglobin in their blood. There is less space for the, carbo for the carbon monoxide that we are giving from outside. This will lead to decreased DLCO and the stupid pulmonologist will say, oh, oh, your lungs are horrible, man, 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 what's gonna happen there? No, he just smoked a cigarette two hours before coming and then washed his hands and washed his mouth with a mouthwash by Listerine and he's fine and he's eating mint and he's brilliant and the pulmonologist is stupid. High altitude leading to low P, big AO2, which is in the alveolus, which will lead to low PAO2 in the arterial less oxygen competing for hemoglobin no kidding because there is less oxygen to begin with this is going to lead to increased dlco because you know two things compete for the hemoglobin sites oxygen and carbon monoxide if you have less oxygen more carbon monoxide is going to bind to the hemoglobin your dlco is going to be higher than predicted this was the best discussion about dlco in the history of humankind okay until now maybe in the future there'll be a person who is better than me who is going to explain better but until now this is the best video for you guys okay i'm sorry i'm a very humble person as you know and then we have three questions number one which of the following is the likely underlying pathophysiological mechanism of this presentation second question which of the following should be done for screening purposes previous screening test was negative which of the following is the best management option let's face it guys you're struggling to learn about legionella mycoplasma pseudomonas rhinovirus etc please check this website it's called picmonic they have pictured mnemonics for medical students nursing students dental students pharmacy students etc please check the link in the description below they are not a sponsor of this video thank you for watching please subscribe and join the tribe hit the bell to get notified follow me on facebook i have more than 100 cases there you can support this channel and i'll send you my notes my cases and my pdfs and even my audio notes they are available for direct downloads and they are yours forever and my dropbox folders are divided by subjects and they are organized having my notes and every other stuff all of this in patreon.com slash medicosis thank you so much for watching as always be safe stay happy and study hard this is medicosis perfectionalis where medicine makes perfect sense until next time